Okay, let's get started. So I want to thank you so much for, for joining me today. Uh, welcome to How to Coach and Engage Team. Thank you for your participation either live or via our recording. I will record the, the webinar to just make sure that if anybody wants to be able to view it at any point later uh, that you're more than welcome to. And also please have your mobile device close by. Uh, I'm gonna ask you some live uh, attendee kind of polling questions as we, as we go. You might be able to answer those in uh, a different browser on your web, on your uh, computer as well, but doing it on the phone is a little bit easier. So please be, feel free to be able to ask or uh, have any of your questions answered inside chat. My partner, Tiffany, will be able to kind of manage that and see if there's anything in there that either I can address or that she can answer for you pretty quickly. But I want to start uh, this webinar with just a quick quote that I think is pretty powerful, but also talks about engagement, at least to me. And the quote is, to build a strong team, you must see someone else's strength as a complement to your weakness and not a threat to your position or authority. And that came from a lady named Christine Kane, who's founder of a company called Propel Women. And I just really like the quote. I think it's a great kind of start or launch to thinking about engagement and thinking about what it means to, to be a coach. And in my experience, right, the most happy, engaged, and productive teams are the ones where all members are allowed to use their strengths each day, have a place to vulnerably share their life story, and where everyone can take a risk, learn, and be a part of something bigger than themselves. So if I've not met you or you've not met me, uh, here's a quick picture of me doing an event not too long ago. Uh, for 12 years, you know, back in the state of Michigan, I used to work for my family's small business. Uh, and then I moved to Phoenix, Arizona in, I think it was about 2003. And I worked at the Four Seasons Resort Scottsdale uh, for a couple of years and then helped to open a boutique hotel uh, in Northwest Phoenix. And then went to um, the Thunderbird School of Global Management to get an MBA. But as a second year student, I was able to coach first year students and then post MBA ended up working at uh, Banner Health for a couple of years as the director of talent sourcing. And so then after I finished that, decided to start my own coaching business, I actually did work for Arizona State University for a few years um, to be able to coach master's students uh, as they were trying to find a little bit more about jobs and possibilities and opportunities. So for me, the reason I tell you that background of that story is, is that I've seen employee engagement through the lens of what works inside of a family business, what work inside of an organizations that have 50,000 employees, inside universities, inside entrepreneurial startups, um, and even small to medium-sized businesses that I consult with an awful lot today. And so over 25 years of, of leading people and over 10 years of being an executive coach, I've been able to see a lot of things and transformations that have happened to say, what is it that really, what does it mean to be a coach or what does it mean to be engaged? So if you haven't visited michaelsiever.com, Take a peek, lots of free downloads there, 200 plus blogs and insights, uh, hundreds of media features, and there's probably now 20 plus videos um, on the homepage, just interviews that I've done or webinars like this that we've recorded. Uh, so please make sure you take a quick peek at, at some of those, those things. Now, when it comes to the things we'll talk about in the next 45 or 50 minutes, I want to just give you some interesting research that I've been finding lately with regards to coaching and engagement. And I'm going to level set some stuff and just give you some additional definitions around what it means to be engaged or what it means to be a coach. Um, and then give you some really interesting suggestions, at least I think, around how to create those engaged teams, how to make sure that we're really facilitating the right employee engagement surveys, and how do we design meetings that really allow for people to be their most authentic self and to create that engaged environment. And then I'll finish with just a couple of things that I actually pulled from my recently published book about, uh, it's called I Know, but I, I pulled some stuff from chapter number nine with regards to different coaching principles, things that I try to deploy when I'm coaching people uh, in the community. So for me, like I said a second ago, I've spent thousands of hours you know, in the arena with people really understanding what shapes them, why they communicate the way that they do, how to help them or others feel seen or heard in a way that really does deepen trust or builds relationships or does try to find a way to improve engagement. So what I'm seeing, and perhaps you're seeing this yourself, is that society is really going through this massive transformation. And so astrologists call this transformation the shift from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. So we're moving from a very centralized, a very bureaucratic, a very hierarchical organization-driven society to a very decentralized, grassroots, very holocratic approach to life. And there's not right or wrong ways, it's just that this transformation is occurring and we're kind of seeing it uh, for ourselves firsthand. So if you have at all in the last probably six to 12 months felt stressed, anxious, and nervous, you have felt that, right? And that's Earth's energetic profile shifting. 
If you ever want to learn more about why those things are happening, look up something online called the Schumann Resonance, and it'll help you to understand the shifting energies on Earth and then how it impacts the human body. Now, when I think about all of these transformations and how we're moving into the age of Aquarius, there are three major drivers that I keep an eye on or that I'm focused on. And I'm a big guy that likes to explore root cause of something, right? Not just take something at face value to really figure out why it is the way that it is. And so I think one of the things that has really driven this transformation in society, of course, is technology, right? We all have access to the world's information and each other basically for free. Um, but number two is, is that Western economy, specifically American economy, has become a very affluent society. And it doesn't mean that everybody in America is affluent. It just means that we're a very affluent economy. And earlier this year, we passed the $23 billion mark in terms of economic size. So that means that per capita, we're all having access to about $69,000 worth of annual income. That doesn't mean that we all make that much. It's just per capita amount of money that's available to us. And now the third thing I want you to think about as kind of a driver of some of this change is Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that because we've made such a big transition in society, we've moved out of the first four levels of Maslow's hierarchy, which is focused on deficiency needs, like making sure that we have shelter and food and things like that. And we've moved into the area entitled growth needs, right? How do we find our life's mission? How do we build meaningful relationships? How do we find a way to genuinely make an impact on those folks around us? So I want to cover some fun research. I want to do a little level setting, give you some suggestions around teams and surveys and meetings, and then just kind of close with some fun coaching principles. But first, what I want you to do is to grab your mobile device and let's see if we can do a, a polling question. So let me see if I can open this up and, and get it launched. So if you go on your mobile device, oh, it moved. So if you get on your mobile device, um, and you go to menti.com. So visit, uh, open up a browser on your phone, go to menti.com. And you can see the code there at the very top of the screen. And that uh, eight digit code is 9066-7514. And then the question um, that I want you to answer is, would you prefer a robot therapist to a human therapist? Kind of a silly question, but also an important question. Um, so if, even if you don't want to respond via your mobile device, that's okay. Your answers are anonymous. Not even I can see who responded with what. Um, but if you would prefer a robot therapist to a human therapist. So for the folks attending with us live today, it looks like there's a, a resounding position of no. You would prefer to be able to talk to a human being. Um, and I appreciate that because I kind of do therapy work and I would love to be able to talk with you as opposed to uh, having you default to a therapist. So keep your uh, phones close by. We'll probably uh, have another question or two to, to think through in a minute. So, so most of us said no. Um, so I want you to take a quick peek at the screen here. And this report came from Oracle and another organization that they partnered with called Workplace Intelligence. And they surveyed 12,000 Oracle employees across 11 countries in the last two weeks of July, 2020. Now, 82% of the respondents were between age 26 and 54. So predominantly Gen Y and some Gen X. And what they found was that stress was highest amongst Gen Y and Gen Z. So most of the stress that people were feeling around the world was actually in the United Arab Emirates or in Korea or in China. Um, and so what they were finding was is that the cause of this stress was actually um, isolation from friends, suffering uh, family relationships, maybe there was a trauma or something that occurred, reduced happiness, maybe it's poor physical health. There was a number of things, sleep deprivation. There were a lot of things that were causing people to feel uh, stressed or having a mental health issue. And you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, burnout rates by country. You know, the United States was ranked relatively highly compared to some of the other countries around the world. And then the point of me asking you the Mentimeter question, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, um, is that the vast majority of people that work for Oracle around the world prefer a robot therapist to a human therapist. And that to me is pretty interesting. So according to their overall statistics, 68% of the respondents said that they would prefer a robot over their manager to be able to talk about mental health. Um, and then they, there was also the statistic that 82% of the respondents believed that robots could support their mental health better than human beings. So I say all of this to say is that 76% of those respondents did say that they think that employers should be doing more as a way to try to find a way to engage those people who are struggling through some sort of transformation or change. 
So on the right-hand side, you can see that those folks in Asia and India and China, they really strongly believe that it would be easier for them to talk to a robot than it would be to talk to a human. Um, and I think the number in America was actually about 19%. And so we're in this environment where uh, most of us said no, like we'd prefer to talk to a human. And I think according to the respondents here, 19% of people said that they would rather talk to a human in America than a robot. So when we think about burnout or we think about productivity or we think about how do we increase engagement, there could be as simple things that we could do as far as like expanding the human resources team's skills around mental health awareness. Maybe we expand our relationship with an employee um, assistance program or medical benefits provider. Um, if you've watched the TV show Billions, maybe you think about bringing a staff psychologist onto your team, which could be really significantly helpful. Um, I've also seen organizations literally compensate their leaders for living their core values more or becoming better at emotional intelligence. Um, and a really simple one is, is that we could just have our leaders block more time one-on-one -on -one for dialogue with people across the organization. So another interesting uh, kind of piece of, of research here is that um, the Edelman Trust Barometer, every single year, they try to assess and understand what's the level of trust or that we deem as being like, who do we deem to be credible uh, in the marketplace, whether it's an organization or a person. So uh, earlier this year, they released their 21st annual trust barometer across 28 countries. There were 33,000 respondents. And what they found was that when you looked at government, media, NGOs, and business, business was the most trusted. But when you see that scale there, business was only ranked a 14 out of 50, which is pretty low, or business was only ranked a five out of 35. I don't know about you, but that really does scare me, right? When we think about how do we view institutions in our world, we don't view the vast majority of institutions in our world as being both competent and ethical. And the ones that we perceive as being both competent and ethical are the ones we find credible or trustworthy. They're businesses, but they're also ranked very, very low. So one of the quotes that came from the uh, presentation that to me was pretty interesting, and I'll, I'll read it to you, is, in fact, none of the societal leaders we track, government leaders, CEOs, journalists, or even religious leaders, are trusted to do what is right. So we are in this environment where we're going through this massive transformation in society. And I think we're moving from a, the old kind of personality ethic into this idea of a character ethic that kind of came from Stephen Covey and the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So, but what is happening is, is that although we're not trusting those leaders anymore, we are trusting, and this is the important piece I want you to remember, is, is that people in my local community are trusted more than a person who has a title or some sort of authority. So a person, quote unquote, like myself, is more trusted than someone who is not. So it's really important that we start to think about how do we share more facts? How do we act with empathy? How do we over communicate truthful, unbiased and trustworthy content to really drive a connection to those people that we work with? So as this kind of rapid decentralization of authority and decision making occurs, the relationships that we have with our peers and how we show up authentically with them is going to matter immensely. One final thing to recognize here that the report talked about was that consumers now have the power to force corporations to change, right? So in the old kind of age of Pisces world, the, the organization was able to kind of direct and control what they wanted to do. But because of review sites and sites like um, where we're allowed to give reviews and, and share them on Amazon or Yelp or similar, consumers now have the capacity to drive the type of change that they want. Same thing exists for people inside of our organizations. Now, one final piece of interesting research comes from Deloitte. And what I really liked about this particular chart, and you can see, you know, who is the actual entity in society that's responsible for workforce development or for personal development. And you can see that professional associations, unions, governments, and educational institutions, they're important, but they right now don't have as much power or sway or a responsibility, if you will, as an organization or as an individual. So as we see this really big shift happening in society where we have to pair the dynamic nature of jobs with this really equally dynamic potential of people to reinvent themselves, the onus and the responsibility kind of shifts to the employer or possibly to the individual to help facilitate that change. So as we shift from the age of production into the age of imagination, right, we're in this place where we don't have to train so much more so on technical skills, we now have to teach people emotional intelligence, creativity, entrepreneurship, things that will help them become a part of a smaller group or team.
So for this particular Deloitte study, what they found was that 59% of respondents need more info to really understand their workforce's readiness. So the vast majority of teams don't even know what their teams do or don't know. And 38% said that identifying their skill, their skills, right, their organization's skills was actually their greatest barrier. And only 16% of the respondents to this particular study said that they were actually going to make any investment. So that to me was really striking in that we've placed the onus and the responsibility on organizations and individuals, but the organizations aren't making the spend. So that really does kind of get us to start to think about how do we as individuals drive some of that change. So I just want you to think about when we're driving engagement, when you think about those peers or some of those people that might report to you, it's really important that you make recommendations and suggestions to them to get them involved with third party organizations. So if it's volunteering with some sort of an organization, if it's serving on a board of directors, um, some sort of an external community project matters immensely, right? We want to be able to give them opportunities to learn. Now, internally, if it's designing shadow or buddy programs, we're in this place where experiential learning inside of businesses is yielding really high retention. So we want to give people inside of our organization chances to learn experientially because we'll be able to recruit a little bit better and we're going to be able to keep people a bit longer. I also think that there's value in shifting compensation programs, right? So if you think about how do we design new on the spot reward programs, finance programs, we're going to be able to keep some folks longer and possibly give them some sort of remuneration for learning and staying with our business. So I think that we have to find a way to not only continue to learn ourselves and create those opportunities for ourselves, but we have to also think about how do we connect our company to more community events to give our employees opportunities or chances to learn experientially from their peers. So there's a lot of stuff that's shifting and changing as we move into the age of Aquarius. I just wanted to give you a little bit of information and in, in research uh, to try to, to guide you a little bit and see like, hey, I see these things happening and now you might see them a little bit more as you navigate your life day to day. I want you to grab your mobile device again. Uh, simple question, um, looks like, where did it go? Hold on, or maybe it went away, there it is. Okay, somehow or another it didn't pop up. So the second question is, is at work, how engaged are you? So on the very left-hand side would be low or one and on the very right-hand side would be 10 or high. And you can drag the little slider to say, how engaged are you at work, right? No right or wrong answer. I just wanna say like, how engaged are you in your workplace? And again, your answers are anonymous. So I just wanna see for the, for the folks who are joining us live where you stand. I'll give you another second or so to, to debate that. So it looks like we're about eight. So, so for the folks participating with us live, we're about an eight out of 10, which I think is fantastic, which is completely not normal, but it's awesome that you guys are. So thank you so much for, for responding to that. Let me go back to my slides. So when we think about employee engagement, I wanna share just a couple things high level and then I'll dive down into statistics about it and what it means is that you probably know on the left-hand side, an organization called Gallup. And so Gallup is a global analytics and advice firm that helps leaders and organizations solve really big problems. And they've been collecting employee engagement data for more than 80 years. They have 35 million respondents in their system across 160 countries. So it's a really interesting place to be is that they for a very long time have been gathering data about folks like you or I, and they're really trying to find a way to drive engagement to build exceptional workplaces. And you can see from the left hand side is that they're focused in on how do we create that, that engaged employee who's enthusiastic about or committed to their workplace? Now, quite similarly, Willis Towers Watson there in the center, they define employee engagement as an employee's willingness to or inability to, con to contribute to their company's success. Now, Willis Towers Watson is a little bit different than Gallup in that they're focused in on firms they can manage risk, they're focused on optimizing employee benefits, they're really in the business of cultivating talent or trying to find capital uh, to be able to help businesses grow. Now, Willis Towers Watson originally started back in 1828. They've got 45,000 employees across 140 countries, and they're able to track some of the similar things that Gallup might. But what they said is that it's really about what's the employee's willingness, right? So important to focus in on that. What's the employee's willingness? Now, the last one, the definition on the right-hand side from Aon Hewitt, they're a bit different, right? They're in the risk mitigation business, they're in the retirement and health solutions business, but they've got 50,000 employees across 120 countries. 
and they're talking about what's the employee's psychological investment. So employee engagement can be any number of things, but it's really about the willingness of the employee to be enthusiastic about being willing to contribute or have a psychological investment in. So I look at this and I say, what's the theme or what's the undercurrent in that it really comes down to does the employee believe in your organization's community or societal impact, right? They want to know that what they're doing, they're walking into, they genuinely have a chance to learn, to grow, and to contribute to something bigger than themselves. So when we think about being in this age of imagination or being in sometimes what's referred to as the thank you economy or being in sometimes what's referred to as the experience economy, leaders really have to intentionally design the experience of interacting with them and how the community interacts with their company, right? So it gets to be pretty deep, right? And understanding how do we intentionally design a brand and then relay that not only internally, but externally. So I want you to think about that transition from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius and think about that kind of age of production into the age of imagination or the experience economy. And so the way that we go about doing business or engaging people is radically different today than it might have been 20 years ago. Because if you turn back the clock 20 years, people like Jack Welch and Steve Jobs, they were known as being jerks, right? And they were able to get a lot of stuff done in a command and control environment. And so being a jerk was the thing that allowed for success. But now that we've shifted away from command and control into aligning and empowering our workforces, uh, being a jerk or being unemotional is not going to be an effective route to be able to be a great leader. So we have to look at these undercurrents that are shifting society and then say, how do we have to evolve ourselves? So one of the questions I want you to think of, maybe even homework for yourself if you consider it as this, is to say, what is the experience of interacting with you? right? And really intentionally design an experience, right? If you know enough about your communication style, you know enough about what motivates you, you know enough about your core values, uh, you know enough about lessons that you've learned uh, throughout life, or you know what your strengths are, right? There's five easy puzzle pieces that you can gather together uh, to really find a way to say, what's the experience of interacting with me? So when you do that, then you can start to design an experience of engaging those people around you. Okay, so just level setting this idea of employee engagement. So on your screen now is some more level setting around what has happened in the last year with regards to engagement. So you can see from Gallup's chart here that so uh, there was a big transition that of course that occurred for all of us in March, April of last year. And the impact at the onset of the pandemic was that um, the American economy almost overnight lost 22 million jobs in March, April last year. So there was a really rapid shift uh, right in that probably 30 to 60 days. And as of last month, we've only recovered about 14 million of those jobs. So there's still about 8 million people who are still either unemployed or maybe they're, they've entered the gig economy. Uh, I genuinely, maybe they've retired, right? There's any number of things that they could have done. So the last economist that I heard speak uh, Tuesday this week said that unemployment for the rest of this year is going to le level out about 5%. And then in 2022, unemployment rate will probably be about 4% by the end of 2022. So we still have a very long road ahead of us to be able to get back to full employment or having a full workforce. So what that means for us is that we have to be really cognizant of how do we take care of our employees because there's still a lot of things that are shifting and changing in society. Now, what this chart doesn't show is how things have progressed and changed over time. So when Gallup first started calculating employee engagement back in the year 2000, they calculated the kind of bluish green or the greenish line there on the top. I'm colorblind, admittedly. So the kind of the top line there, the 37, 38, 31 line, they found that way back in the year 2000, the average actively employee engaged was only 26%, right? So over about a 20 year period, we have gone from 26% being actively engaged to now about 36% being actively engaged. So there has been an increase over the last 20 years. So what I think is kind of helping with that is that we've moved away from the command and control leadership style and treating employees like robots or just order takers and we started to really engage their skills at a deep level. We've given them a voice. We've given them a chance to rise and feel engaged in their own way. 
Now, the way that I want to help you understand Gallup's perspective here is just imagine that there are 10 people in a boat, right? So we're, we're in a boat and we're rowing forward. So those folks that are in that kind of greenish line at the top, they're referred to as what, what's called actively engaged, right? So they're genuinely happy. They're going above and beyond. They're a great team member. So they really enjoy being in your organization or supporting you. And you can see that about 36% of the American workforce is that. So let's say that that's three people in the boat who are actively rowing the boat forward. So their statistics also show that about 52% of people are just what's called engaged. And those folks are getting the job done. They're doing their job description work, but they're not necessarily going above and beyond. And so in our metaphorical boat, they are basically holding on to the oar, but not moving any water. Okay, but that leaves that kind of bluish line at the bottom, those folks that are actively disengaged, and you can see it's about 13, 14% for quite some time. So that means that there's another one or two people on your, on your team that are drilling holes in the bottom of the boat, right? They're rowing the boat backwards. They're, they're doing something to stop your team from moving forward. So we're in this place where we've seen an uptick over 20 years of engagement getting higher and better as we've moved from command and control into a place of enlightening and empowering, but there are still those folks that are actively disengaged. So when you look at the, your peers around you, three people are pretty engaged and pretty happy. Five people are there just kind of living, getting by, and two people are really actively unhappy. So we just gotta be mindful of those statistics as we look at some of our peers or those people that are on your team. So I wanted to point out here a couple of things is that you know, in, in, on this chart on your screen, you know, the, the number of actively engaged was about 37% when the pandemic first started. There was a little bit of a rise in April and early May as we started to work from home and start to get our hands, you know, kind of um, starting to change our habits and feel okay with being at home. And all of a sudden, some bad stuff started to happen in society. There was a lot of social justice protests. And then all of a sudden, um, engagement and happiness with our work dropped off. And then once we got to the point of kind of getting past that or being able to express our emotions or feelings about that, then there was a rapid uptick to 40% in June, July, which is the highest that Gallup has ever seen it. So the last year was enormously difficult for a lot of people because they all of a sudden had to start working from home. Prior to the pandemic, only 20% of the American workforce worked from home. But when the pandemic started, that number shot up to 71%. So we're in this place where we had to learn completely new habits and routines and rituals almost overnight. Maybe some of us are homeschooling children. Maybe some of us are caring for an elderly loved one. Any number of things could have been happening. So we're in this place where stress and anxiety and nervousness was really, really high, but we were also seeing this rise in employee engagement because people finally felt empowered. They had control over their day. So I just want you to be very mindful of that because the younger folks, um, the millennials, they genuinely appreciate that level of, of flexibility and, and ownership. So when we think about this, I just want you to remember that people are far more capable of change than maybe they give themselves credit for. And when we navigated everything in the last 15 months, we learned that really quickly. So we've had opportunities to reconnect with our families. We've had opportunities to form new habits. And really importantly, people are speaking up. They're using their voice at a level that they might not have ever done before. So we wanna make sure that we continue to give those folks around us opportunities to express themselves. So I wanna talk a little bit about coaching, right? What's, what does it mean to be a coach? So we've talked about the definitions of employee engagement. Now let's look a little bit about what it means to be a coach. And you can see I've put four different definitions on the screen and I, I want to draw a distinct uh, difference between the four things intentionally, because I honestly believe that we should use all four of these at the same time. So it's important that for every person listening is that we have all four of these people in our life and each of them has very distinct purposes. So if you want to become a coach or you want to call yourself a coach, make sure that you're possibly not uh, dabbling too much in the other three areas, but you're focused in on what does it actually mean to be a coach. And from my own experience, of course, I'm a coach, but I've hired over the last, let's say, 10 years, I've had five different energy healers, I've had four different executive coaches, and I've had hundreds of mentors that have helped me in one way or the other. So I look at a mentor, the very top option there, right, is this person who can offer very accumulated knowledge, experiences, and advice as possible solutions for others, right? They're kind of like your personal board of directors. 
in that way, right? You want to be able to collect their ideas in a way that you can leverage their lessons learned to not make the same mistakes in your own life. Mentors are really valuable in that way. Now, when we think about counselors, right, these persons are often trained or certified experts who can uncover emotional resolutions to others' past emotional traumas. And it's important to recognize that counselors oftentimes focus in on the past, right? That's their goal. That's their focus is to help you figure out a way to look back at your past and identify those things that might have shaped you, your habits, your behaviors, your beliefs. And then how do you work through the process of releasing it? And we could talk about that in much depth uh, at a later time. So really important to think about that, that they're focused on the past. Now, a consultant, right, very much this person who might have a certification, definitely an expert who comes into an organization for a certain amount of money to perform a predefined task or to deliver some sort of a goal. So also a very good thing to have, their focus is on efficiency. Their focus is in on results. It's not necessarily in on the person. Now, lastly, and the, the, the thing I want to call out about being a coach is that the focus for a coach is always about today. It's always about who the person is today and how that person's starting to look forward. So a coach believes that all persons have the answers inside themselves, and it's their job. It's, it's not the coach's job to provide the answer. It's that person's job to find the answer inside their own heart or mind. So a mentor gives advice. A counselor helps the person go back into the past. A consultant just offers its systems and ideas and processes, but the coach asks the right timely and insightful how, what, and why questions of the people around them to pull valid answers out, right? So the coach really does believe that the other people have all of the answers inside of themselves, and it's just their job to ask the right questions to pull those answers out. Now, when you think about uh, the transitions that we've gone through from baby boomers being in power to Gen X to Gen Y, you know, baby boomers in their younger years, the economy was much smaller. They didn't have access to technology. They learned through books predominantly, and they were taught throughout their life to suppress emotion. And that success was being able to attain some sort of financial security or to attain some sort of job. And so they were less likely to hire a counselor or more likely to hire a consultant. But the tables have turned, right? When you look at millennials and those folks born after 96, 97, which are now referred to as Gen Z, they're heavily focused on their life's mission and they're less likely to hire a consultant. They're much more likely to engage a counselor and talk about it on social media and coaches. So there's a big shift that's happening where we went from being unemotional and hiring consultants to where the younger generations now genuinely want to openly talk about their experience and their emotions. And we have to allow, as coaches or as leaders, we have to allow those experiences to come into the workplace. So we have to allow for them to bring their life experiences into the workplace. So on your screen, just a, a real high level of various things that when we look at the different generations that are in the workforce, there are still people from the silent generation, which is the generation from the baby boom before the baby boomers. And there are people, of course, from Gen Z who were born after 97. They are, of course, in the workforce too. But I just wanted to call out the ones that are predominantly the largest, right? So today, uh, millennials are the largest percentage of the American workforce. Gen X is second, baby boomers are third. But you can see the things that they value or that their work focus or what they focus on is quite different. And not right or wrong, it's just different things that have shifted over time. So when we think about the technology, we think about globalization, we think about the World Wide Web, we have fully made that transition from command and control to aligning and empowering. I think it was October 2015 that millennials became the largest percentage of the workforce, and they're now more than 36% of the American workforce, so they're a really large percentage. So I just want you to take away from the slide that engaging each of these respective generations takes a very different approach, right? And that's the critical thing to take away is to look at and say, each of them values something a little bit different in how it is that they show up in the workplace. So as an example, let's use the work focus row, if you will, so the second row down. So when the baby boomers were climbing the corporate ladder back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was expected that we would be in the office nine to five, right? That was an expectation and that really worked for their life. And they were, that was part of the, the, the glamour of being successful was that we could find a way to work really hard to be able to climb the corporate ladder and to be able to make money from that. But we're at this place now where we don't necessarily have access to that same nine to five office because technology has changed so much. 
So we can't glamorize or provide compensation based on the number of hours worked, right? We have to think about instead, we got to think about how do we pay people for the goals that they achieve or the value that they drive. So when we look at the work focus, the baby boomers were very much about working long hours. Gen X was the first kind of independent entrepreneurial generation, and they were focused much more on productivity. And millennials, right, those born after 97, they're very much about contribution, not only to their team, to the community, and also from the team and community back to them, right? It's a very give and take relationship. So different to think about that. Now, another one could be the ideal leader. So the fourth row down. So we've already talked about the command and control leadership style of the baby boomers. So what we've seen is that we can't have this one person or a small executive team or a board of directors guiding strategy, right? We need to have more people across the organization doing that. So as de decision-making is decentralized, we have to also decentralize the planning tools and finding ways to be able to empower people at all levels of the organization. So when we think about this decentralization, right, we have to think about the different systems and the processes and automated um, artificial intelligence that really genuinely help that to occur. So what is important to recognize is that when we get information from those people who are on the front line directly interacting with our consumer or customer, we're able to iterate and make faster changes, right, to make better changes. So instead of having that small group of people make choices, we're now trying to turn our entire team into people who can help us make more aligned choices and make them faster. I'll make one final call out here about the learning row, uh, second to the last at the very bottom. You know, the way that baby boomers learned back in the day, they didn't have access to screens. All they really had access was to a book or to a teacher. And so they used to learn in a classroom. And then all of a sudden things started to transition a little bit. Gen X started to learn through the classroom, yes, but also through roundtable discussion, right? We started to see much more uh, group uh, learning, if you will. And then things have really shifted with the millennials that they've kind of moved away from the formal classroom into what Google calls the 10-20-70 the model, right? Where 10% occurs in a classroom, 20% uh, occurs through relationships and conversations like the round table, but 70% is really experiential and peer-to-peer. So we have to think about how do we change the way that we educate those people on our team to help them stay engaged because they really genuinely want to learn. It, that's really important to them, right? Contribution to the self, contribution to others is a core driver in many ways. So let's do another Mentimeter question here real quick. So what percent of your meetings, right? Think about your meetings on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, what percent of them are actually value add in that? So, Options are 0%, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. When you think about the meetings that you participate in day to day, which percent do you think are value add? No right or wrong answer, just wanna see what you guys think. Okay, so we're gravitating a little bit towards the middle of the curve. One of us says 25, a couple of us say 50, a couple of us say 75%. Right, so that's that's important. We're going to come back to that um, in a bit when I give you a meeting structure. I think that might help or, or guide you. So let me talk just for a second about cross-functional teams. Now, many of you within your organizations probably have seen a matrix or a cross-functional team, um, but what I really want to help kind of draw a, a focus to here is is that inside of our organizations, we of course have hierarchies, right? We have direct and specific reporting relationships that we're all accustomed to. So in order to get things done quickly in our society today, in this very decentralized way, what we want to do is we want to create cross-functional teams that take some of the responsibility away from the CEO or the managing principal or from the executive team or leadership team or from the board of directors and get more people involved. And so this probably isn't new information for a couple of you, but I just wanted to point out that when we think about the design of these teams, it's really important to understand that with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, we've already talked just a bit about the first four needs are a deficiency and the top four are growth. So we all have this, this kind of core need for personal development and growth, and we all have this need to be able to contribute to the growth or development of others. And cross-functional teams are a great way to do that. So if you set the right ones up inside your organization, you create learning vehicles 
and you create project teams that genuinely get things done, but you also create a level of camaraderie, right? You also create new levels of friendship. You also create new levels of getting things done faster. So when we think about these things, we want to set them up in such a way that unequivocally at the very top, we've got sponsorship. So we want to make sure that the CEO, the executive team, or the board of directors does support these teams and talks about them or uses them relatively regularly. So if you read Good to Great by Jim Collins, or maybe you follow John Cotter and his eight-step model of change, uh, or maybe you follow Chris McChesney in, in his book, The Four Disciplines of Execution, all of them talk about how critical having executive sponsorship is. So we have to make sure that us as leaders, we're sponsoring these types of, organi these types of organizational functional teams in a way that can really help to navigate change and to improve engagement powerfully. So we really wanna make sure that these teams are heavily focused in on doing things that help make the strategic objectives of the firm much more likely. Now, when I'm helping organizations design this in such a way, oftentimes when you look at the composition area, they default to wanting to put their high performers onto these cross-functional teams, but I don't think that that's the best play because if you have a high performer that's already really actively engaged with your organization, as a coach or as a leader, you don't want to burn them out. You don't want to burden them. So you wanna make sure that you find that next gen leader, that rising star, that person who's about ready to become the leader, if you will, and you wanna make sure that they're given opportunities to stretch and to grow. That's deeply engaging to people, right? When they have an opportunity to learn in that way. Also important when you think about this is that the composition of these teams every level of your organization should be represented somehow. When we think about a decentralized world or this age of Pisces, age of Aquarius world, we're in this place where everybody wants to be able to see how they're contributing to the organization getting better. So it's easy to assign the high performer to these teams, but that's not the right play. In order to engage people, we have to use the composition as like a succession planning tool, right? Don't burden the high performers, give those rising stars an opportunity to really step up, learn new skills, challenge themselves, overcome fears, confront uh, things that they might have uh, not wanted to confront before. So one of the key things about this I also wanna recommend is that we have to bake participation of this cross-functional team into every employee's annual goals, right? So make sure that they design an annual goal about wanting to participate in a cross-functional team like this as part of their leadership development, right? And if you need to compensate them or reward them in some way, that's, that's okay. But I think that we build trust with our employees every level of an organization when they see their peers helping to guide through some sort of transformation or change. Now, the third section here about having a charter, I just put a couple of things that you might consider when you're thinking about designing your cross-functional team. So I help organizations by writing this charter often is that I'm really clear on what's the purpose of this team? What is, it, what is it that they're going to be doing and for how long? What's the actual scope of their authority, right? What are the goals that they need to accomplish in a specific point in time? How are they going to communicate to the executive team or to the entire team if need be? Right? Who are the stakeholders that are going to be involved uh, in some way or that might need to be available? You know, who is actually involved in the team and what is their specific role? Uh, and what's their decision-making process? Right? So when we think about driving engagement and giving some of these rising stars an opportunity to grow and to develop, we can create these systems and structures where there's very clear expectation and we're over communicating what it is that's expected of them that teaches them a good cadence of making sure that they're communicating well with those around them. And you can see at the bottom this idea of training. Now, the big difference to, to kind of call out when you think about if you have to coach a millennial versus you have to coach a baby boomer, baby boomers love to know the history of something. They love to know how it got to where it is. But millennials don't really care about the history of something so much. They care more about the impact on them or the impact on their growth and development. So if you need to sell an idea to a baby boomer or millennial, there's a slightly different approach that you would take. Because when we think about how do we train both of those styles, we're also looking at things like, are they an extrovert or introvert? Are they people oriented or task oriented? Do, what fears do they have? What is their emotion under stress? You know, how do you validate and paraphrase? You know, different things open up those lines of, of communication. So when we're training, not only are we training different styles of learners, but we're also training them on various things to help them make sure that they can chant, they can, how do I say this? They can customize their communication styles and preferences to those around them 
to build buy-in faster. Okay, so it's really important that we give them lots of information um, with regards to uh, how to communicate well, how to function with emotional intelligence, and teach them things that I just mentioned a second ago, John Cotter's uh, eight-step model, maybe it's the four disciplines of execution. There's a number of things that we can teach them about change management. But in my experience, if we just create the cross-functional team without giving them the charter or without giving them the training, they're going to flounder. So we really wanna make sure that we provide them training as soon as they're formed to make sure that they know how to communicate well with everybody in the organization, how to manage change as it occurs, and give them the right technical skills for whatever new software you're going to implement, how to use artificial intelligence, right? how to automate something, any number of things. We wanna make sure that they're prepped and ready for that. Now, another thing when it comes to employee engagement surveys is, now this is another thing that we can think about with regards to being a great coach or being great at engaging the folks around us, is that if you haven't heard of something called Gallup's Q12, I would just encourage you to check it out. So. When I think about creating employee engagement surveys, most of them are done annually. Most of them are 50 to 75 questions. Most of them are done to kind of support the organization's strategic plan to make sure they identify blind spots or blockades and then say, what is it we're going to focus on moving forward? How can we get better? And when we think about that, at the core of all of these employee engagement survey questions, these kind of Q12 from Gallup, is that they're very personal questions. And I'll give you a couple of examples, right? The, the Q12 is based up, how often am I receiving recognition? Does my supervisor seem to care about me as a person? Is there someone in the organization that encourages my growth? Do my opinions seem to count in the workplace? Do I have a best friend at work? You know, are there opportunities to learn and grow? So being an engaged employee comes down to the depth and the quality of the relationships that you have inside your organization. So we can set up all of these surveys and we can do all of these things on an annual basis, but they're only one piece of a much larger puzzle. So what we want to make sure that we're doing is when we choose these surveys is that, and this is kind of the second point down there, is that how do we partner with an external third-party survey vendor who has a lot of experience in your industry? Because what we want is a little bit less about the reports that they create or the actual data we're going to get back from them about our business. It's important. But what we also want is the associative ideas or solutions that they've used with their clients, right? We want to be able to get to a much quicker and faster resolution for some of the problems we might be experiencing. So if we have a team or a leader or a department that's highly disengaged, what are those things that this vendor has done recently with other organizations to help coach up that leader or help coach up that team to get them to the place of being engaged again? So important to look really closely at who those survey vendors are. So another thing, the fourth option down there is this idea of how do we over communicate what was rated low, what it is that we're working on and how and when it would be done. So with an organization that I helped that's an accounting firm, what we did was is that the HR team was relatively small so we couldn't really use them to be doing a lot of the change management and facilitation. So they created a cross-functional team uh, from across the organization, three different locations in the Southwestern United States and that team was then responsible for helping HR go through and facilitate some of these changes. And so what we did was, is we facilitated the survey. We did some big announcement to the entire team. Here were the survey results. Here's what it is that we're going to work on. And then we went to each of the respective department heads with one of the cross-functional team members and made sure that they were aware of the three focus areas that they had. So once we worked on and said, hey, okay, here's your three focus areas, that leader then had to come up with very specific time-based goals in order to repair the problem that existed, right? So then not only was the leader being given new information about how he or she could improve, but then we also had that cross-functional team member there to support and guide and provide accountability support. That was wildly important. So then after during every weekly team meeting that that leader had, one of the standing action items had to be discussion of the employee engagement survey and what they were doing to improve over a period of time. So when you start to bake this material into weekly discussion or daily discussion, it becomes part of the culture and you start to put people and the organization's betterment first. And that's a really important thing is that employee engagement surveys shouldn't be done annually. I think I read recently that General Electric stopped doing annual performance reviews and surveys like this on an annual basis back in 2015. So for six years, they've been doing things on a monthly or a quarterly basis through apps and through other things. 
So it's just important that when we think about engagement surveys, yes, do the annual survey. Yes, create those plans that allow for the improvement of leadership style or department culture. But we also have to layer in things that happen on a day to day basis. Maybe it's a quick pulse survey that goes out via email or an app on your phone. I put there on the bottom left there MBWA, which is management by walking around. It's a very simple thing, right? Just uh, and if you can't see people in person, you know, it's just scheduling time on your calendar to be able to have conversations with various team members. And there are lots of weekly recognition systems. If you haven't heard of Nectar or Bonusly or Blueboard or Fond or Kazoo, there are lots of free apps out there that allow for you to be able to create uh, employee to employee and leader to employee recognition systems to let them know how they're doing. So whatever that is for your organization, it's critical because those younger generations of folks genuinely want feedback more and faster. So again, the old command and control style was we're gonna give you the annual survey. The align and empower style says, okay, let's do the annual survey but now we need to layer in the coaching from the leader, the coaching from the cross-functional team and finding a way to get more feedback faster to those members of the team. Now in the pandemic world, we're also seeing uh, a lot of people working from home for a period of time or working from anywhere. So it's just really critical when we think about employee engagement or as us being coaches is how do we create a culture that existed inside the organization? How do we create that virtually and maybe it's a book or a movie club, maybe it's a, an affinity group, maybe it's a town hall. You choose the thing that's important to you, but at least once per month, be doing something that allows for every employee to bring their life experience into the office or into the virtual office, right? That's really important. And I know we're getting close to the end of the hour here, so I'm gonna talk just about a couple more things real quick. Uh, and then if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, but here is a really quick uh, kind of productive meeting step-by-step um, st -step process that I would use or I would consider uh, or encourage you to consider to use. And so you can see I've kind of labeled them. Um, so whether you use this one-to-one -one or whether you use this one-to-many is up to you. But when I think about what it is that the millennials or Gen Z genuinely want out of a work environment, they really want to be able to know how they're growing and developing. So one of the first things that we could do in a one-to-one -one meeting or a one-to-many meeting is share wins, but make sure that they're not just professional wins from the last week or two, make sure that they're also including some life experience or personal wins into the discussion. If we do that, we're going to start the meeting on a good place because now the brains are releasing oxytocin, they're releasing dopamine, and we're going to start in a happier or better place. So that's important. The step number two, is, is that after everybody's gone around and been able to share some of their wins if they feel safe to, right? we have to hold our people accountable. Now we have to have each of them go person to person and say verbally out loud, what is it that you accomplished in the last couple of weeks since we last set goals? So it really important that it's done verbally and that everybody hears it because we don't want the leader to be the only one that is holding others accountable or a possible cross-functional team member holding someone accountable we want peer-to-peer -peer accountability to, to creep in, and that's way more powerful than just being held accountable by one person. The third thing, core values. If you have some time in a meeting to discuss core values, you know, I help clients uncover their personal core values. So it's really easy for a leader to ask an employee, hey, here's the company's core values. Can you tell me how you live them? That's one thing, and you should do that. But secondarily, allow for those people that are on your team to talk about their own personal core values and how they're living their personal core values, right? Allow for that to occur inside the workplace. Now, the more that we have opportunities to do this and to bring our personal selves into the workplace, the better off we are going to be to increase engagement, right? Those millennials and those people on Gen Z, they really genuinely want to be able to have that feeling of contribution, right? They're giving and they're getting meaningfully. Fourth step, making sure that you're reviewing those roadblocks um, anything that you can do to um, remove, get around through, overcome some sort of a challenge. As a leader or as a coach, it's oftentimes our work to make sure that we're taking those roadblocks out of the way for a person and giving them a chance to be able to just be successful. And the last thing, similar to number two, is, is that whenever we're about ready to wrap up a meeting, each person around the table, virtually or in person, needs to say what their action items are and when they're due. Right? That creates a cadence of accountability that might not have existed before. But what we found from Gallup's research is that when we're on a team of people who are genuinely accomplishing goals and we can trust one another and they're dependable, 
we are more likely to be happy and engaged. And that was actually supported by uh, Google in their, their, their uh, what's called Project Aristotle. They also found the exact same feedback. So when we're on a team and there's a cadence of accountability and people are dependable, we genuinely want to work in that environment. So real quick, um, we've got about two or three minutes here. One final polling question for you to consider. Let's see if I can get that up. So I just want you to think and just free form your response. It doesn't matter. It could be a book. It could be online. It could be in person. Just what is it? What is your favorite way to learn? It doesn't matter. Is it, it could be audio. It could be visual. It could be kinesthetic. Um, you can free form your responses and you can answer multiple times if you want. But I just want to know what's your favorite way to learn? Maybe. Okay, so someone said podcasts and books. I like that. Let's see if there's one or more. Maybe they'll come in. Okay. Someone uh, joining us, former college athlete, uh, likes to be able to learn kinesthetically or through experience. So another person hands on and in a group. YouTube learning is also very, very good. I like that. Graphs and tables. I'm an introvert, so uh, I love to be able to look at patterns and numbers, right? So each of us is different in the way we learn, and and so thank you for taking the time to respond to that. And I recognize we're getting close to the top of the hour, so I'll bring us to a close. Um, I won't touch on this too much, but when I think about uh, coaching principles, right, what it means to be a coach, there's just five of the nine things that I address in my book that I think it really does what it means to be a coach. And so if you're not a certified coach yet, but you're genuinely interested, there's something called the International Coaching Federation uh, or coachingfederation.org. And they are kind of the clearinghouse of all things coaching. And there are a number of schools that, that are certified to be able to train on their curriculum from IPIC to Coactive to Coach U. There's another one called the Integrative Wellness Academy. And all of those, I share all of this to just let you know is that there are, uh, there are certifications and things that are being developed around what it means to be a coach. So if that's interesting to you, go ahead and explore that. What you see on the screen is just a couple of things that I would encourage a coach uh, to really be focused on, right? Especially in the upper left-hand corner, you know, make sure that we're not judging anyone, uh, even if they don't take our advice or our counsel. Um, everybody's a mirror for us. So if we're judging someone else, we're just judging ourselves, right? So really making sure that we're leading by example a quick reminder about learning. Everything that occurs in our life is actually for our benefit. And we just have gotten into a habit in American society where we assign a positive or a negative emotion to everything. So I just wanna make sure we take away that emotion and just focus in on what did this event occur? What did it teach us? And how do we, how do we move forward with it? Another thing with regards to boundaries, the very last one is, is that one of the most powerful words in the English language is no. And most people don't use it, right? They don't have the courage to use it. So the way that I look at yes versus no is that yes is like a time debt, right? I owe somebody something, right? It's a responsibility for the future that maybe or maybe not I want to honor. So most powerful word in setting boundaries uh, to enable success, to enable trust is to just say no to things that are not in alignment with what it is that you're trying to coach someone through, right? So setting those boundaries is really important. So just real quick, if you haven't uh, heard, I published a book January 1st of, of this year, and you can see on the screen the three major sections of the book, Dilemma, Discovery, Decision, and you can see each of the respective chapters that exist under each of those sections. And this book is really a how-to guide for any organization to move a person or a business through the three phases of transformation. And there are nine processes, so one uh, process at the end of each chapter that can really guide you to go from this place of having to end and let go in dilemma to being in a neutral zone in the discovery section to then really starting in decision to start to plan, to start to take action, to start to coach people and, other, and others. So um, I put this quote on the left. I think it's a pretty good one that I even started talking about the arena when I first uh, kind of started. So when we think about being a coach or we think about driving engagement, it is a hard job, right? There's a lot of things that are shifting and changing in society. There's a lot of emotion that exists in society. So to be a leader, to be a coach and to be an engaging coach, it's hard, right? So you have to be able to honor that if you're not in the arena doing the hard work, right? You have to, to just say, you're, if you're going to get feedback, if you're going to get people uh, saying bad things about you, 
where we just can't be really interested in that feedback. We have to stay really heavily focused in on what is it we're trying to learn? What is it we're trying to do to uplift people, knowing that there's just a lot of things that are shifting and changing on earth. So if you're not in the arena getting your ass kicked, I'm not interested in or open to your feedback. Right. I just love that Brene Brown quote in, from her book, Daring Greatly, uh, because it really helps to level set what it is that we need to do as leaders is that we're going to take criticism, we're going to take judgment, but it's our work to kind of flip that script and stay really heavily focused in on how can we uplift and better others. So as I said at the very beginning, right, the most happy, engaged, and productive teams are the ones where all members are allowed to use their strengths each day. A coach believes all persons have the answers inside themselves, and it's not the coach's job to provide the answer, but to pull the answer out of the coach or protege. If you want to reduce burnout, expand your HR team skills, hire the staff psychologist, or create more opportunities for one-to-one -one dialogue. Don't forget about Covey and the, the character ethic. Leaders lead with facts and act with empathy. If we over-communicate truthful, unbiased, trustworthy content, it's going to help us rapidly decentralize authority and decision-making and drive up employee engagement. In the age of imagination, learning experientially yields far better retention. And if we create those right on the spot reward programs, we're going to be able to really help to keep people with us for an extended period of time. If at all possible, connect your team to community issues and events, again, helps them feel like something bigger than themselves. And I asked you a question about a quarter of the way through and I said, hey, what's the experience of interacting with you? So maybe consider that question in the next couple of weeks and say, how do I design an experience? I also said that people were far more capable of change than maybe they gave themselves credit for. So maybe take a quick look in the mirror and recognize that you probably navigated a lot of change in the last 15 months, give yourself some kudos. And just a, const just a, a little reminder that the, the millennial generation and pretty soon Gen Z, there's this strong need for them to align the needs, their personal needs, to align with our personal needs, to align with the business needs, to align with the community's needs, right? That contribution and that connection is really important to them. So the way that we can empower them is through really decentralized software, through really decentralized decision-making, really decentralized cross-functional teams. There's any number of ways that you can coach and engage team. But I think now is the right time to be able to start figuring out how that's going to happen. So thank you guys so much.